Hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about how I learned to CSS. I'm also paranoid about my presentation malfunctioning halfway, so if you, can, if you want to scan the QR code and load the slides on your mobile device, feel free to do so. Now, I've talked to a lot of people about CSS, and a number of them have told me that they, they don't like CSS, that CSS is hard to wrap their head around. So I'm going to share with you how I wrap my head around CSS. Now, the purpose of CSS is to make stuff on the web look good. I mean, you can't have cascading style sheets without style, right? But I also see CSS as a means of creative expression. I mean, some people like to write, some people paint, some people make music. I like to CSS. Now, as with any creative endeavor, we need some inspiration. Well, the CSS specification, if you print it out, I don't know, maybe it's this thick. So there's a lot of stuff in there for us to explore and play with. Many people, myself included, write articles about CSS. Some of us even write books. So read those, because they usually come with code examples that you can fork off and play around with yourself. Podcasts. Now, I'm sure a lot of you commute in some way or another. I personally commute by bicycle. So there's not a lot of things I can do with my hands or my eyes. Technically, this applies if you're driving as well. But your ears are free, and there are a lot of good web development podcasts out there that discuss the latest trends, techniques, new stuff, which is perfect for finding out about new stuff and also discovering old stuff that you never knew existed. And if you're anything like me, you might find conferences a tad expensive. I mean, maybe I'm up here because I was too cheap to pay for a ticket. Joking, kind of. And a lot of the conferences, uh, including this one, actually put up videos of the talks online after the fact. So if you want to skip over the face-to-face -face interaction with like-minded people or the prospect of meeting your developer idols, then go ahead, just watch the free videos online. There's really a ton of good content there. And then just start building stuff. Now, Una Krav Una Kravitz once said this on her excellent podcast, P.S. You must subscribe to it. People go to conferences to get inspired and learn about things that exist or maybe an overview of how to use it, but then they really learn that thing, that technology, when they go home and practice it themselves. So that's what I hope that I can, I can do today, uh, that at the end of today, at the end of all these excellent talks, that you too will be inspired to go home and CSS something yourself. But building stuff is not enough. You really ought to share what you've built with the world because well, you can do this in two ways. You can either write, write about it or you can talk about it. Because when you do that, you're forced to explain stuff. And this really makes you learn about what exactly what's going on. So who, 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 who is this person standing in front of you talking about CSS? I mean, Aisha introduced me a bit. So my first name is Hui Jing. I'm a self-taught designer and developer. I work at a company called Deep Labs. And I write blog posts from time to time. So I built some stuff recently, and here I am sharing it with all of you. Because I only have 15 minutes, I'm just going to cover some key points only. First up is what I call over-the-top radio buttons. So I watched a video of Ethan Marcotte's excellent talk at an event part earlier this year, a link in the slide, and I was particularly enamored with his demo demonstrating progressively enhanced radio buttons. Now, one thing about conference talks is, unless the speaker is live coding, the code snippets that we show you are just a tiny snippet of the key functionality. I learned that the hard way, because I was like, oh, there's not a lot of code here. I could probably build this in half an hour. Wrong. It took me at least, I don't know, three days, and maybe more. But um, these are the cool takeaways I got from trying to build this demo. So I'm going to switch. So here's the demo. So it's. Essentially, just radio buttons, but there's some animation going on. There's some sliding and some zooming. You can clear your selection, and everything just slides back. This is all powered by CSS. The only JavaScript involved in this demo is uh, to add and remove classes. So then there's also this slight pause. It's an animation thing. Sarah actually touched on animations earlier. So the crux of this demo is a technique called the checkbox hack. So I'm sure all of us have built HTML forms before. And we should know that form control elements like inputs should have an associated label element. So you can do this in two ways. You can either have the label contain the input, or you can use the for attribute on the label, which points to the ID of the input element. I actually found out recently that the second method is recommended, because some assistive technologies don't work properly with the wrapping method. 
So now, when you click the label, it's as if you clicked and checked the radio button. And because you can use images as part of the label, not only text, you can actually get really fancy with the label. So then, when a radio button or checkbox is checked, we have a checked pseudo class that we can play with. So together with some combinators, uh, either sibling selectors or child selectors, depending on how you wrote your HTML, we can have some fun with the state change. So we can have some animation. As Sarah mentioned earlier, the way browsers work now, there are only two things that can be animated cheaply, transforms and opacity, and both of which I use in this demo. So that sliding thing that you saw earlier, that was translate x, and I used it with some nth child selectors. So my four options were laid out with Flexbox, actually, in a single row. So they're only going to move along the x-axis and the selected option always ends up in the second position. So we can set up some positioning rules using nth child selectors. So if the first option is checked, it will always move one position to the right. So I can use translate x 100% to do that. And for the third and fourth, they're always going to move one or two positions respectively to the left. So we'll use a negative percentage for the translate x. And then there's the zooming bit. So basically, what I have were two divs that were stacked on top of each other along the z-axis. So if you peek into my source code, you'll see some z-index rules thrown in there. And the use of the not selector here is helpful, because what happens is that the stuff that you want to display when checked is hidden from view at first. And I did this by setting the opacity to 0 and scaling it down to nothing. So when you check one option, you want the other three to disappear. And the isCheck class is only added to the selected option, while the other three without end up getting these hide from view properties because they are not isChecked. So the classes that are prefixed with is are added and removed by JavaScript, and those are the, those are the only things that the JavaScript is doing in this demo. And then transitions. So transitions are what pull this whole demo together, because without them, your my options would just jump into place. There's none, none of that smooth you know, sliding and zooming. And I use transitions quite often. I think it's quite commonly used. And the one thing that I actually never used before this demo is the transition delay property. And you use it to specify the amount of time the browser waits from the time you request the animation to when the animation actually starts. So it turns out that very slight pause, it's a 0.1 second pause, it actually does make a difference. So I have this demo up on CodePen, and you can fork it and mess around with the timing just to see the effect. right? So I watched another talk. Now, this talk was by Harry Roberts on structuring your CSS. It was great. There was Subway involved, the sandwich, not the trains. But his point was, your CSS classes shouldn't be monolithic, because that's actually creating a single point of failure. So you handle layout separately from component styles and have specialized JavaScript hooks. So if you change the visual style of a component by maybe changing classes, you're not going to break any functionality. So that's the reason why I have these disparate classes here. Then someone pointed out to me that I should really make my demo keyboard accessible. Well, I'm going to prefix that I'm not very good at accessibility right now. So I'm still learning from people like Chris about how to do this well. Unfortunately, I couldn't come up with a solution for making the checkbox hack keyboard accessible. So if any of you do, please come and talk to me about it. But the next best idea I had was to have a toggle. So you can turn the, uh, you can turn the animation off. You can just fall back to a normal. So this is just your basic normal radio buttons. And, um, for those of you who have actually never tried navigating a form with keyboard, know that you use tab to jump between elements. You use the arrow keys to navigate between options. And if it's a checkbox, you use the space key to select and unselect your options. So the source code and the code pen link if you're interested. Right, so one more demo. This one is what I call uh, CSS album art. So I came across this blog post by a designer come musician. He's called Scott Hansen, and he was outlining his design process for album covers. And I noticed that his design for some of his covers was pretty minimalist, you know, just shapes. Shapes that can be created only using CSS. So here's the demo, and um, as you can see, the, the covers are really simply just shapes. So these 
all created using just CSS. There's no images involved. And um, for some weird reason, I thought that it would be cool to try doing this in just w with just one single diff. So I definitely needed some help with, from pseudo elements. So when you have the, you can use the before and the after pseudo elements. So now I have like a total of three elements to play with. The thing about pseudo elements is that you, it must have the content property in order for it to work. And the content cannot be blank. You have to have at least empty codes. So pseudo elements are considered inserted content. So what, what happens is that, ooh, sorry. What happens is that it's not visible in the page's source. So ideally, you don't want to have any critical content that is inserted into your, uh, your website in this way. But for decorative things like what I'm doing right now, I think it's, it's, it's still fine. So here we go, shapes with CSS. So it's going to start off with something simple. This be a circle. The border radius is obviously the key property here. But one thing is, I also wanted to make my demo responsive. So none of that fixed with stuff. No, 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 no. We're going to use viewport units for this. So what viewport units are is, these are units that are relative to the height and width of your viewport. And the vmin unit that I'm using here actually is based on your current viewport width or height, depending on whichever is smaller. So next shape, actually, I want to talk about is a triangle. So you can create triangles with CSS using the border property. So unlike, if unlike me, you had better things to do with your life, you've probably never done this before. But say you create a diff of any size you choose, a 200 pixels uh, square, for example. And then you apply a different colored thick border to each of the four sides, so, so maybe about 30 pixels. You'll see that the edges of the border actually meet diagonally. So now, if your div does not have a height or a width, then you're left with four triangles. And so you see, you can have triangles of different directions. And with that, we can create different CSS triangles. So for this case, it's a right-facing triangle. So all you have to do is to make the adjacent borders transparent. So for this one, my top and border are transparent, while the, uh, the desired color is applied to the border left. You can even change the width of the um, border to change the shape of your triangle. So the next shape is a trapezium. I consider this a cop-out shape because it's actually just a regular diff with which it just snipped off with CSS clip path. Um, CSS clip path uses the same polygon syntax as SVGs and uh, as CSS shapes, with each point being a coordinate relative to the width and the height of the diff. Unfortunately, clip path is not supported in any of the Microsoft browsers, but um, it's currently under consideration in the masking module, so I think you can probably vote for this somewhere. OK, this is a fun one. Um, so on some of the covers, I'm going to switch back. You can see a series of dots at the side. So not this one. So those, those, those series of dots, those were actually done using the, what I call the box shadow trick. So I came across this fantastic site showcasing really interesting single div CSS creations. And when I first saw it, I was like, that's not possible. That, how, do you, how on earth do you actually do that with one div? Turns out a lot of it involved this particular trick. So you know how I said that the before and after pseudo element gave you two more elements to play with? Box shadow actually gives you, I don't know, unlimited more? Someone please correct me on this. But the, the, limit, the limitation here is that it can only be one shape, because, I mean, it's the shadow of something. But the syntax is as follows. And what you can do is you can use the offsets, which are the first two values for positioning, and the blur radius for sizing. So for the albums, there are 11 dots. So it looks like that, 11 dots, 11 box shadows. So that's that. Um, OK, this one is purely gratuitous because my original code pen demo just had everything aligned right smack down the middle using Flexbox. But then I came across an article by none other than Sarah Drasner talking about CSS scroll snap. And I'm like, mm, why not? I just you can just throw this in. It seems like a perfect use case for this. So 
CSS scroll snap was actually introduced to enforce scroll positions so users don't land at awkward scroll positions that leave a page partially on screen when panning. OK, fine, it's scroll jacking. But I can understand the reason for this use case, and it actually works kind of well with the keyboard. But the specification isn't stable yet, and it only works on Firefox and, surprisingly, Microsoft Edge. But then Edge doesn't support clip path. This is, you know, life is hard. Um, but the key property here for CSS scroll snap is the scroll snap type on the container and the scroll snap coordinate on the inner element. So this is the kind of thing that is really makes a lot of sense if you uh, play around with the code yourself. So I also have a code pen demo. One thing about this is that if you look at the existing polyfills that are around online, I found two, but they both only support the older syntax, so they don't work very well. CSS scroll snap only works natively on, as I said, Firefox and Edge. So the source code and the code pen link is here. One thing to note about trying out the latest and greatest is to always check with caniuse.com just to see how browser support is. Um, but that being said, there's never been a better time to, than now to live on the cutting edge because evergreen browsers are a thing now. And we don't have to wait six months for a new feature. <coughs> Safari. So, Here's all the related reading in more or less the order that I talked about them. Really good stuff. So suggest that you go through this when you have time. And that's it for me.